Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is for me a great pleasure to welcome and thanks Dr. Jordi Piera for accepting to participate in the Master of Translational Biomedical Research, which is imparted by the Valle Brown Institute of Research. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, share uh, the to present our invited speaker. Okay, so uh, Jordi, Dr. Jordi Piera is the director of the Digital Health Strategy Office at the Catalan Health Service and the Servei Català de la Salut. And he's going to talk about the clinical and diagnostic data management in the Catalan healthcare system. Uh, Jordi has uh, got a degree in, computation, in computing science engineering. Uh, he got a master in business management. Uh, also a master in telemedicine in, and e-health. Um, he got the PhD in economic evaluation of digital health solutions under the information of knowledge society. And also he is a great expert analyst and software developer. Um, but, uh, he actually, uh, he participated in the deployment and implementation of the electronic medical record. Also, he has also a visiting, uh, he's a visiting lecturer at the University of Udin, associate professor of the work and co-director of the executive master in digital health at the University of Barcelona. Uh, he has the research interest in normalization of clinical concepts through standards, integrated care delivery models, and in the design, implementation, and evaluation of digital health solutions. So uh, he is one of our best experts in data management and uh, its application in digital health. So for me, it's a great pleasure uh, to have uh, Jordi with us. And um, please, um, for all the, the, the audience, uh, just think in some questions that, uh, that you can uh, in, include, you can upload in the, uh, if you can see here, you have preguntas, please uh, add your questions here in this section and not in the chat. Okay, and at the end of his talk, we're going to discuss with him. So without any other delay, uh, please, um, uh, Jordi, can you uh, share your screen? Let me, uh, okay. Thank you, Josep, for your, for your very keen uh, introduction. Uh, and yeah, I mean, let me see if I know how to do this. Okay. I guess that uh, yeah, you can see my presentation, right? Yes, right. Thank you. So, well, uh, yeah, we are going to talk, uh, I mean, the seminar objectives. So as, as Josep was mentioning before, I mean, we are going to learn, uh, I think, uh, well, my presentation is structured in, 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 two different, uh, in two different parts. The first part is in regards uh, of the current situation here uh, in the Catalan uh, National Health System. So you will understand uh, which is the various types of data that we hold in here, which are the regulations uh, that apply uh, for primary and secondary usage of, uh, of data. Uh, you will also learn uh, which are the pathways for uh, this data extraction and, and its uh, usage. And uh, the second part is this uh, tiny last point in here, or this tiny little bullet point in here, but well, this will be also a, a very important part of my presentation, which is uh, in regards of, uh, of the digital health strategy for Catalonia, that for us is the, the, our new uh, positioning towards, I would say, a better future. Uh, and you will see that it has a very strong focus on, on data and information uh, management. So yeah, we are starting with, uh, with the first part, which is uh, the one that I told you, which is, well, which is the current situation right now. So uh, I understood from Josep uh, that uh, in the initial, well, in the first modules of, of these masters, you have had some uh, explanations and understanding on the on the Catalan health system and how it is a structure and I would like to highlight I mean this is well you know the assigned population universal coverage the, the budget 
but for my presentation the important part is the things that you have uh, here underneath which is these three these three main topics uh, for me the most important part and we will keep building on that across the across the presentation uh, is that we have a very heterogeneous uh, ecosystem of providers uh, with different uh, I would say uh, legal uh, Legal, well, different legal entities uh, that come from the historical evolution of the Catalonian healthcare system and that historically they have had uh, autonomy to decide on their information systems. And this has uh, a very big impact in, in the format that we are currently holding uh, all this data. It's 940 different facilities all across the, 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 the ecosystem. And I would say that the thing in the middle is the, is the most important one, which is uh, the biggest sources of data in the Catalan healthcare system are the electronic medical records, of course. Uh, I would say that we are very fortunate uh, when we compare ourselves with, with other regions in Europe because we have just one system for primary care. And uh, here in Catalonia and also in the Spanish healthcare system, primary care it's very strong uh, also when compared to, to other regions and countries in Europe and uh, primary care effectively acts uh, as the gatekeepers to the most specialized resources so we are very fortunate to just have one system in here it's a bit old-fashioned uh, we started developing it in the in the 80s but well it's still running and and we are in the process of, of changing it and I will give you some hints uh, later on on the presentation when it comes to hospitals, we have 29 uh, different products, not installation products. This means that we have 29 different vendors uh, that are uh, acting across the, the, the Catalan healthcare system. And uh, the same product can be installed uh, in different facilities. Thus, well, the implementation may be a bit different in between uh, different uh, healthcare settings. And well, for social care, which is also an important part for us, and, and you know that it's more and more important, uh, the social determinants of health, and we are working very close by with, with, with social services. We have at least 10 different systems, uh, but well, uh, with a huge heterogeneity, uh, and I would say with less standardization than, uh, than, than we have in healthcare. So this is the, the nice picture or the nice overview of uh, what we call the digital health platform, the Catalan digital health platform. Uh, I have more slides on that. I mean, this is the, the, the cool one that I wanted to show with you. Basically, what you need to understand in here is that centrally from the, from the Catalan NHS, we have put in place some infrastructures uh, where we try to uh, improve uh, the care processes uh, by providing uh, centralized services to the overall ecosystem of uh, healthcare providers. Then we have the system for primary care that is outside of this uh, central platform. And then we have, of course, uh, pharmacies or the systems for intermediate care hospitals uh, uh, and also for, well, specialized hospitals, the personal health folder and, well, and the infrastructure for, for data analytics. This is uh, another view. Uh, I, I will have three views of this, uh, of the historical evolution. Uh, I, I prepare three different views of this because I know it's not, uh, it's not easy to understand. Uh, and well, the three of them try to build on the, on the, same, on the same situation. So here, uh, 90s, uh, 80s, 90s, it's where we uh, managed to uh, I would say digitize uh, the medical records, the classical paper-based medical records. We did a huge effort in between the 80s and the 90s. Uh, we ended up with this, more or less, this ecosystem of, uh, of applications. Second thing that we did after that uh, was, well, I would say that uh, these medical records responded a lot uh, just to, I mean, they were trying to just digitize the, the, the care process, which was paper-based, paper and we're not taking advantage of uh, all the technologies that now we have accessible, such as 
well, you know, predictive models, uh, natural language processing, and all these different tools that uh, allow us to provide directly into the into the clinical workstation uh, clinical decision support tools to, to physicians. So I would say that most of the solutions that we have now uh, respond to this first wave of digitalization and are a bit uh, out to date. Uh, the second thing that we did was, well, we have a system that we wanted to be uh, as much integrated as possible, and we need these different healthcare organizations uh, to collaborate in between each other. So uh, following this paradigm of the uh, integrated care systems where primary care effectively acts as the gatekeeper to the, to the most specialized resources and, uh, well, citizens that tend to move uh, all across the, the healthcare organizations in Catalonia. So, in here, back in year 2007, we deployed what we call the Shared Electronic Health Decor of Catalonia, or the HC3. Uh, this infrastructure, it's an infrastructure, and I will give you some numbers uh, in the following slides, but this infrastructure aims to share all the patient-related information that or but I would say all the objective patient related information that is collected uh, throughout the, the network of public providers with all the different providers. So the idea is let's make available this information for everyone and be able to see it in order, of course, to avoid duplication of tests uh, and to avoid medical errors and all the things that you can imagine. Inside of here, we have also a unique uh, electronic prescription system that works for uh, for ambulatory, so for outpatient, basically. Uh, hospitals, they have their own system for hospitalized patients, and we will also see a bit on that. It's one of the big departmentals in hospitals. Then, uh, lately, uh, we have developed another infrastructure aiming uh, to centralize uh, all the digital images that uh, up to the day were uh, being, uh, well, every other hospital was sitting on top of them. Uh, this meant uh, a very big cost uh, in terms of maintaining the infrastructure, an infrastructure that is increasing continuously, also with the new diagnostic uh, uh, X-ray imaging machines. Uh, it was growing too fast and it was, and it is an infrastructure that was very uh, complex to maintain. So what we did was establishing a central repository for this, uh, for the Catalan healthcare system with the idea of federating all these different repositories that we have and just uh, healthcare organizations holding uh, only the data that it's more used. So having a cache, I would say, of the data that it's maybe for the last two years, the one that they will give the most usage. And then in case that they need something, some images that come from, from the past, then they can directly uh, pick them from the central repository. And this is possible, of course, it was not possible back in the day because communications were not so good, but now communications allow this process uh, to happen. Then uh, trying to, I mean, following this, this strategy and trying to improve uh, the way or the coordination in between, I would say, healthcare levels and providers, we developed this platform that you have underneath, which is the care process management. It's called IS3, and it's a, pla a platform that allows us to uh, exchange information between providers, mainly referrals in between the one and the other in order to better uh, coordinate care pathways. Then uh, we have also, and this is, I would say that the boundaries uh, of the uh, healthcare organizations would end up in here. But of course, as you know, uh, we have been moving uh, and everywhere else uh, to patient-centered care. So we have been moving the boundaries of, of uh, the healthcare provision one of the ideas is to move these boundaries up to the uh, to patient's home and for them to be more aware of their own health condition and be able to be part, uh, an active part of, of their uh, clinical conditions. So I would say that these three pieces that we have in here are part of this strategy. One, which is the, the personal health folder, 
it's just showing us uh, for every citizen in Catalonia that register into the platform will show uh, their patient related information that has been collected in the public healthcare sector. And uh, well, it has been growing like crazy thanks to the pandemic. And I will brief you about the numbers in the, in the next slide. And then uh, this is two things that we are currently working on them. I mean, they have also exploded a bit with the, with the pandemic specifically the remote consultations, either synchronous or asynchronous, and also the link in between uh, the mobile health apps and the telemonitoring, uh, telemonitoring solutions with another solution that we have, which is called uh, M-Connecta. So <coughs> before, before going into the numbers, uh, I think I'm going to, to explain you uh, a bit which is the situation that we have in these biggest uh, silos or repositories of information that are the, the, the electronic medical records. So basically, my focus now will be in this, in this part uh, underneath here. So this is the typical overview of the components. Uh, and I use the, the, the hospital information system because, well, it's, uh, it's still and remains being the biggest uh, source of information. Uh, we call this uh, hospital information system, HIS, and those are the typical components that a, a hospital information system has. Uh, the biggest four, I would say, well, uh, the most important one, of course, is the, the, the clinical information system, which is the one that you have in here, which is the place where all uh, physicians and healthcare professionals uh, collect their uh their clinical notes diagnostics uh, treatment options uh, blah 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 when it comes to the other big parts of the of the medical record i would say that it's these four ones that you have in here that's what we call the four big departmentals and this is laboratory information system this is the nursing information systems with all the cure and care plan this is the radiology information system and this is the pharmacy information system. And well, and some of them link with other systems. For example, the radiology information system, which is the system that radiologists work with, it links with the archive of, of images, uh, which is called the, the, the PACS. Then uh, there are two outsiders, I would say, in this, in this picture, uh, but uh, that are growing fast. Of course, biobanks have been in there for, for plenty of time. It's also a very big source of information. Uh, in there, every I would say every single big hospital uh, or uh, third level hospital in Catalonia has its own biobank. Uh, currently, we have, uh, I would say, 12 biobanks. And uh, they are, well, holding uh, this specific information uh, following their own uh, their own standards, and uh, this is something that is exploding. Not only here, I mean, all the genomic information and all the I would say sequencing, genomic sequencing, is growing like crazy, and uh, we are facing a situation where every uh, big hospital, again, a third level hospital is starting to set up uh, their own infrastructure. And this is something that centrally from the NHS, we are trying to put some ruling in this uh, in order to avoid the silos. I have not talked yet about the silos, but this is just uh, to give you a bit of the flavor of all the different types of, uh, of data sets that we have just in the hospital. There's uh, in the hospital, uh, I would say, two other uh, big silos of information, which are all the part of the medical devices. We are here in talking about diagnostic and treatment uh, devices. Um, they appear everywhere. I mean, back in the day when I used to be uh, uh, the chief information hospital, uh, uh, chief information officer of a big, uh, I would say, healthcare organization, uh, all these devices appear in the in the physician's consultation from one day to the other, and you don't know how. There's sometimes that it's pharma companies that are providing this to the physicians. Sometimes uh, they come as part of a clinical trial, but the truth is that in this outpatient consultation, uh, you would find a new device connected to a specific laptop. 
that is collecting patient-related information. It's not plugged in into the into the network, not plugged in most of the times to the to the medical record, and uh, it's a bit uh, the feeling is a bit being this the wild west. I mean, really being very difficult to control uh, such a deployment of of different solutions following uh, different standards. Then uh, I made this outside, uh, which is all the all the research data. And here it's very typical in the in the hospital setting to find uh, Excel sheets, access uh, databases, uh, red caps, all sorts of different tooling that healthcare professionals use to collect uh, patient-related information. In this case, <laughs> most of the time uh, assigned to uh, clinical trials. But well, this is another source of patient-related information that somehow is not linked uh, or most of the times it's not properly linked to the full uh, landscape of, uh, of information systems inside of a, of a hospital. And now this is, the, this is the last part and this is what is coming now, which is uh, following this strategy that I was telling you that let's move, uh, we want really to move the boundaries uh, outside of hospitals or outside of the healthcare setting and we want to arrive into the uh, into the patient's home. <coughs> the reasons I mentioned before, I mean, we want them to be more aware of their condition and all this prevention and promotion of care strategies uh, play uh, a big role in this and the shift in between uh, reactive to, to proactive care are the ones that are making us deploy these solutions. Well, this is a huge uh, media, I would say, of uh, health apps. Right now, uh, I was reading, I don't know, I think it was six or seven years ago in the markets, in the, in the markets of the different uh, stores uh, of mobile apps. We had, I think it was 300,000 different uh, health related apps. The other day I was reading, uh, now they account for 6 million and they are being used. I mean, patients use them uh, on their own. Physicians are referring uh, patients to use them. And they have absolutely no link uh, with uh, with the legacy systems uh, that the hospitals hold in most of the cases. Telemonitoring solutions is another one. Those ones, well, tend to be linked, but well, still work in in, in proprietary systems. So, all in all, uh, this is a bit of a summary of of the things that 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 I've been mentioning right now. So, Catalonia, we have seventy one hospitals and they are using 29 different vendor products uh, for the EMRs, uh, which doesn't mean installations as I was mentioning before. Uh, each third level hospital, according to some prospections that we did, holds at least 800 silos of information. This includes research information, uh, this includes the medical devices, this includes the different departmentals, so the nursing solution, the laboratory solution, the X-ray imaging solution. All of this in a hospital such as Valdebron, it can be more or less around 800 silos of information. Uh, a second level hospital may hold 400 silos of information. Uh, we did some prospections uh, all across the healthcare system, and we think that right now we have around 6,000 silos of information. Uh, of course, EMRs uh, being the, 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 the biggest source. And well, all these technologies of the digital transformation are making uh, these silos to, to, to increase. And uh, I would say that one shared characteristic that all these silos of information has have is that uh, they follow proprietary data models. So information is not represented across these different systems equally. So the EMR in Valdebron doesn't necessarily hold the information in the same way that the EMR in uh, Mataró. So we have a problem that we call it in, in, in information systems, the problem of the meaning of this data, uh, which is the, 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 the it causes what we call the problem of semantic uh, interoperability. So the same clinical concept may be represented differently 
in different systems. And once we want to take advantage uh, of this information or do some benchmarking strategy among these two different healthcare settings, well, we need to find an agreement of which is the minimal data set that we can share in order to, I don't know, assess the benchmark of a fast track uh, diagnostic uh, for oncologic patients. Here, the most common thing is that we do, this is an example, I mean, we may pick an, uh, dates of the first referral from the primary care doctor, the first echography done at the hospital, but uh, there's a lot of granularity uh, which is happening behind the scenes that we are not able to uh, analyze properly. And now I am using the, the, the view of the NHS because of all these different uh, data models and all these different silos uh, of information. What we say, and this is not my words, and I have also a slide uh, afterwards about this, is that data is not following the patient. So this is, uh, those are the words from Rachel Dansholm. She's a good friend from, from, the, from the UK in the NHS. And she said, data is for life. Uh, and data should not be for one application. Data should follow the patients. And well, this is something that we are that we are working on on around that. Uh, this is just to give you uh, some examples uh, of the different standards that that we use uh, in 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 all these different uh, uh, well, in all. I would say in our setting, but mainly uh, in the EMRs and in the interoperability in between the different EMRs. So diagnostics, we are using ICD-10. Uh, procedures, we are using CPT. Uh, this is from the American Medical Association. In digital imaging, we have to reach an agreement and we are working in a standard called DICOM. And here we manage uh, to, to, to agree on a standard. For laboratory results, we are using in general LOING. For clinical terminologies, it's very common to use Nomad CT. And then for interoperability, we have plenty of different standards. These standards have rise precisely because of this, because uh, all the EMRs, or basically most of the EMRs worldwide, are building uh, on proprietary clinical data models. And there's a need to share information. So, Big corporations, uh, big vendors uh, of EMRs, specifically the ones in the US, have been pushing all these different standards. I won't go in depth into them, but uh, when we are at the questions, uh, if you want or you have interest, we can, we can talk about them. But well, all these different standards, you need to have the idea that uh, we are using this to exchange information uh, in between the different uh, I would say parties of the of the public ecosystem. Uh, here are the numbers that I that I promised you before. So uh, just for you to have an idea. So here again, it's the it's it's more or less an historical uh, I would say evolution lie of the digital health platform in in Catalonia. So I was mentioning late eighties, early nineties, we developed the the we. That's the first wave of digitalization of the of the healthcare system. Social care records, well, we had something here. One of the first things that we did was uh, establishing a unique patient index. Uh, it's called RCA, and that's a technology that it's very important because it allows yeah, uh, it allows us uh, to identify the patient uh, in a unique way. Uh, it may seem that, uh, well, everyone should have this. Well, the truth is that in the UK NHS, they have uh, at least uh, four different NHS numbers. They call it in their NHS numbers because they have one for Scotland, one for Wales, one for the Man Island, and another one for the, for the, for the United Kingdom. So it's not so easy in there. Well... Here, for all of our population, we have a unique number, which also links with the Spanish one. So we have two numbers. We have the number from the Spanish uh, healthcare system, and then we have the Catalonian one. Uh, the second project that we were able to deploy at scale from a system level perspective was the uh, electronic prescription system. It's called CIRE. 
uh, for us, it's part of the of the shared electronic health record of Catalonia. Here, it's every other single ambulatory medication that is going to be prescribed to a citizen going through the public network of providers will be delivered through uh, through CIDE. Uh, here you have some numbers uh, about CIDE, the amount of prescriptions and, and, and the amount of dispensed medicines. This system has also a link with pharmacies. So pharmacies will receive uh, this electronic prescription uh, digitally and will know uh, which is the to which patient must be delivered this, uh, this, this pharmaceutical. This is very important to avoid uh, medication errors and also to control one of the biggest sources of expenditure of the public healthcare system, which is uh, the, the, the administration of, uh, of medication. Then, well, shared electronic health record. We started, and that's a very important piece for us, and I will go in depth a bit into the shared electronic health record in the, in the following slides, but at the very beginning, mm, our concern with this was, okay, let's make it work. So what we wanted in here is uh, amount. So the primary driver for us was just to get information, no matter what. So it was send us what you have, even if it's dirty or the quality of the information is not so good. And then with the years, we took advantage of the bilateral contractual relationship that we have uh, from the Catalan NHS and uh, the public providers to keep switching or to put them objectives in order to start improving the quality of this information and at the same time structuring this information. Right now we have in there more than 600 million documents, but nowadays the information that we are receiving is 70% structured information in a series of standards that I will go uh, in the following uh, slides. Another point, uh, what I was telling you before, I mean, moving the boundaries outside of the hospital. Uh, we deployed the, the, the personal health folder back in year 2009, and it took us great effort to extend this. Uh, we had plenty of problems when it comes to uh, the digital uh, certificates for citizens to be able to access. In order to register, you had to go face to face into one of our primary care centers and this did not foster at all uh, the uh, amount of registered users in the personal health folder. By the beginning of the pandemic, and I'm talking, so think that we deployed this in year 2009. Uh, by the beginning of the, of the pandemic in uh, March uh, 2020, uh, we just had only 400,000 registered users in the shared, uh, well, in the personal health folder. Uh, well, in here we did, uh, we take advantage uh, of the public health emergency. That's one thing that we did to avoid patients having to go face to face to the primary care center. That's one thing that we did. And the second thing that we did was just uh, deliver all the PCR result tests, all the vaccination uh, certificates and everything. Uh, so also some uh, the bureaucratization that we took advantage to do during the pandemic. So you don't need to go and renew your, uh, your chronic uh, prescription uh, to the primary care center. You can do it online. Well, all these different services that we were doing face-to-face, uh, -face, we moved them into the personal health portal. Plus, we took advantage of the state of alarm and the public health emergency to avoid patient registering face-to-face. Uh, -face. So, well, now, today, we have 4.5 million citizens, which is a, a astonishing achievement uh that has well that we cannot compare i mean it's a tenth uh or more than 10 uh, percent uh growth uh in respect to what happening from year 2009 to 2020 so in 11 years we did not manage this well the care process management tool uh 15.6 million referrals and this central pack system uh, uh five uh, thousand million uh images
And something that also scaled up a lot, as everywhere else uh, around the world, is the remote consultations that right now we have uh, more, than, more than 12 million. So now I would like to focus a bit on the, on the shared electronic health record of Catalonia, because as you can imagine, this is, I would say, the biggest source uh, of data that we hold at the Catalan NHS, because every other healthcare provider, they have their EMRs, but here the central piece has a lot of the information which is uh, hosted by all this uh, federation of electronic medical records. So this is again another uh, to give you an idea of how does this work. So those are uh, examples here. We would have an EMR, Argos, that's the one that it's being used but uh, by Valdebron Hospital and also by 21 other hospitals in Catalonia. This integrates through web services uh, and the technology that we are using here for the messaging is HL7 CDA. It's uh, sending information to the shared electronic health record of Catalonia and then we show uh, a subset of this information to, uh, to patients. Every other different healthcare provider within the Catalonian public network of providers is entitled, and it's not that it's entitled, they must, because it comes uh, in the objectives that we put for them every year, they must send this information throughout this web service into the shared electronic health record of Catalonia. And that's the way it happens. And, uh, well, right now, for example, with the mobile health apps or telemonitoring solutions, we have another piece, which is this ME Connecta that we are now deploying, that uh, everyone will have to connect to M Connecta, and then M Connecta will send the information to the shared electronic health record of Catalonia. We do this in this way because all these medical devices, imagine a blood pressure meter or a pulse oximeter that work in Bluetooth technology and that link with a tablet PC for a telemonitoring solution. Well, all these devices are using different standards. So this is somehow the concentrator of all this different uh, information. There is also another reason to do this, which is that all these medical devices may be collecting continuous information. Uh, this means that uh, you may have uh, an implant, uh, if you have diabetes, uh, to monitor continuously your glucose. Well, all this tendency of your glucose daily, maybe it's not interesting for the shared electronic health record of Catalonia, plus the, uh, the storage model, which here it's uh, mainly relational, and right now it's relational database, uh, it's not appropriate for such type of information. So here we are storing this information in a non-relational database, which is managing better uh, the, the collection of continuous monitoring. And then just uh, in the shared electronic health record of Catalonia, we just share the tendency and not the full data set that is collected in here. Uh, this is for you, and I don't aim at all for you to, to understand this. I mean, this is more or less uh, the huge, um, I would say, problem that we have here uh, when integrating all these different systems. So this is to give you the idea that uh, underneath uh, this technology lies uh, a huge complexity. Uh, I always say that uh, this is like uh, a bunch of cats have gone uh, into a place where you have all these uh, bull uh, balls and they have been fighting with them. And that's, well, a, a bit, a very complex string, uh, a, very, a mix of strings, uh, or in this case, integrations, that, well, sometimes uh, I am surprised that the overall thing uh, still stands and, and works because it's truly uh, really, really complex. Uh, and here I wanted to share you a bit of the, of the types. I mean, that was one of the objectives uh, of the seminar. Uh, I explain you a bit which is the information that uh, hospitals uh, have uh, throughout all these different components. And this is the information that we have uh, centrally in the, in the shared electronic health record of Catalonia. As you can see, uh, there's information that is structured and there is information that is uh, non-structured. 
And then we may have uh, a mix of both. For example, the biggest source of information for the shared electronic health record of Catalonia, and it's possibly 80% of the information that we have in there, it's documents. It's documents uh, that um, are non-structured. Uh, when it comes to, uh, well, the document itself, the, clini the clinical notes and all, the, uh, and all that part. Uh, here we are talking about that clinical reports, uh, reports about uh, images, uh, test reports, laboratory reports, uh, pathological anatomy, all this sort of thing. And here we have a mix of things. We have um, some metadata that has been structured for each of these documents uh, using the SNOMED CD. But then possibly the document itself, it's currently uh, a PDF file. Here, uh, it's true that we are advancing towards uh, structuring these documents uh, using natural language processing tools, for example. And I will put you an example. Here you see that we have the pathological anatomy and we say that this is non-structured. But again, uh, here you will have pathological anatomy results and we will tell you that yes is a structure what what have we done in here what we have done in here is work uh, closely with uh, data scientists and specifically with the catalonian institute of oncology we have taken many of these reports i think it was a data set of 25000 uh, reports we had someone, uh, a pathologist, that did the coding manually in order to train uh, the algorithm. And then we worked with data scientists uh, to train the algorithm uh, appropriately. And we came, uh, we managed uh, to uh, structure up to 21 variables coming from this, uh, from these reports. The algorithm has been uh, validated. Uh, it has, for seven of the parameters that we are able to identify in there, we have almost 99% accuracy. And then for some others, well, different, uh, different, I would say, confidence. But uh, all this, what we have done now is we have analyzed all the historical data and stored this information uh, structure in a structured way. So all this historical data is now being uh, processed through this algorithm. Plus, we have uh, put this algorithm in the entrance uh, of the shared electronic health record of, of Catalonia in a way that every other report that is coming through it now will be structured and all the data saved uh, in, the, in, in the database in a structured format. Well, uh, my point with this was, was mainly this. I don't want to go in detail about all the different types of informations. You will have the, the, the presentation and the, and the standards that, uh, that we are using. But still, uh, every time that you read in here proprietary, this means that this may be, uh, if it's structure and it's proprietary, this means that it's a relational database where we have a table with uh, our columns and with our rows. And we have come up uh, with these columns and, and, and with these rows. So it's not following uh any standard and this is a this is a continuation of the of the information that we have in the in the shared electronic health record of catalonia uh, now we are starting to move uh into the into the next uh so that all that previous part was just trying to give you a grasp uh of uh all the information that we have, well, I would say clinical treatment, patient-related information that we are working with uh, across uh, the Catalan uh, healthcare ecosystem. And the main idea is that there is a huge uh, heterogeneity uh, of uh, silos of information that uh, follow different uh, standards or clinical data models that do not allow uh, data to follow the patient, even though uh, we've been very successful sharing uh, medical records. And don't get me wrong, I mean, this is not a negative, uh, this is not a negative message. I mean, 
Uh, in the UK, they are not sharing medical records all across the UK. Uh, and well, that's a big country. In the Netherlands, they are not doing this either. Uh, in the Nordic countries, this is not happening either. I mean, we are one of, or possibly, the, the, the region with the biggest or the highest uh, uh, radius of uh, sharing information all across the healthcare system uh, in a multi-provider environment, which makes it uh, very difficult. And uh, possibly, historically, uh, we are the first ones. I mean, uh, we started doing this in year 2007. So that would be my messages for, for, for this part. Now, uh, the second part starts to be uh, around uh, regulation and, and how can we access this data, which is the, uh, the purpose and, 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 well, which are the legal frameworks uh, around uh, medical records, being them, again, the biggest source uh, of, of information that we have uh, in the public healthcare system. So, I mean, the main objective of the medical records, as you can imagine, is uh, the provision of, of, of healthcare services and uh, to ensure uh, the, 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 that the clinical care that we give is uh, accurate uh, and uh, has or follows uh, the qualitative standards and, uh, well, the main idea is to hold all this data uh, related to, to, to a patient. So the main purpose of the medical record is clinical, I would say, and that's uh, what we call the primary usage uh, of this data that we hold in there. It's for clinical uh, or medical or healthcare purposes. Uh, but there are other uh, usages that uh, can be given to, uh, to such uh, a tool, which is uh, teaching, then with the perspective of the healthcare planner, uh, when we are planning uh, resources, allocation of resources, and all that sort of thing, it's the quality of care, and uh, also, well, by matters of uh, public health, you will have uh, epidemiological usage, or even, I mean, if there is some claim uh, about something that has not wrong, well, it may serve also the purpose of, of judicial research. So um, those are, uh, and I don't want, I mean, this is, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, for me, this is very boring, but it's important uh, for you to know. Uh, those are the laws uh, that regulate uh, EMRs I would say at different levels. So this is the law uh, related to the to the rights uh, and the autonomy of patients, and this is the Catalonian one. This is the Spanish one. Normally, what you will have is that you have the European, then uh, you have the Spanish one, which will be normally stricter, and then you will have the Catalonian one, which must implement the European, the Spanish, and then uh, our our specific characteristics. And well, more or less, those are all the different regulations. This is also, this is more a general one, not a specific on, on, on health related information, but basically on personal data. And then this is the, the, the regulation on, on, on the personal data protection and, and the warranty once, well, interacting with uh, digital information. Uh, a very important point of this, if you can imagine, is, well, who can access the, the, the EMRs? And uh, we have four different uh, regulations that, uh, well, put emphasis into this. The first one is the one regarding to healthcare professionals. So this is the act of delivering, uh, of delivering healthcare. So you have the one for healthcare professionals and you have the one for administration and management staff. So all the people that is uh, at the, well, uh, helping you uh, get a visit with your doctor, all these uh, administrative people, uh, or what we call medical administrative people, may have some sort of access uh, also to uh, personal health-related data. Well, those are the two laws that regulate this. And basically, we can summarize that you can only access uh, 
the data of a certain patient in which uh, you are involved uh, in the care process. So you cannot just start swapping around medical records and start looking in there by the sake of nothing. So basically the message is even physicians, the only reason why they can access uh, a specific medical record is because they are involved uh, in, the, in the care process of this specific uh, individual. Uh, then uh, there are two other regulations that, that those are more, uh, they are not linked uh, specifically to the delivery of healthcare services. One is more linked uh, to um, the planning, author planning authorities. In this case, it would be the Catalan Health Service or other accreditation authorities. And this is the law that regulates that, uh, well, some specific individuals at the NHS level uh, for the purposes of inspection, evaluation, accreditation and planning uh, can access uh, specific uh, medical records. And then there is another one, and this is the last one, and those, I would say, um, the other motivations uh, that allow you to access medical records, and this is the law that uh, somehow Mm, tries to uh, set the ground uh, for this to happen. And in here, I would say that the, the most important part is that here the concept of uh, anonymization or pseudonymization uh, plays a key, uh, a key role. Uh, of course, not in the case of judicial uh, and also in the case of research, once you have consent. But uh, I would say that's the, that's the most important one. Uh, in regards of this, uh, I have provided some uh, extra material or some complementary material. Unfortunately, it's only in, in Catalonia. Uh, it's a document that has been created by the TIC Salud Foundation uh, from the office, well, the Data Protection Officer, the Office of the Data Protection Officer that in the case of Catalonia, we have, a, even though healthcare organizations have their own uh, data protection officer, we have a central one for all the Catalonian healthcare system, which is located at one of our public foundations, which is called the Tic Salud Foundation. And I have uh, given you, uh, or you will be provided through the Moodle, uh, this uh, report that explains uh, all this uh, in way more detail. Uh, this is a summary, and that's, uh, well, that's, uh, I thought that this was a very, or a bit abstract, so I decided to, to, to build uh, this, this visualization. So basically, patients can always access their uh, medical records, and that's something uh, that lies on something called the, the ARCO rights here in, in Catalonia and in Spain, and it's that the, that the patients have the right to access their data, change their data, oppose the data that is written in there and blah, blah, blah. And well, most of the times we are not doing this properly, but that should be the case. And third parties will always be able to access this information, but only under specific, uh, specific circumstances. And that's where all these different laws that I was uh, speaking about uh, are uh, or have emerged. So even healthcare professionals, uh, they have their specific law. And I told you, I mean, it's when you are involved in the treatment of the, of the patient. And uh, I think that there's a key thing uh, which is important to know that due to this change of, uh, I would say in general, not only in healthcare, that the professions that were existing back in the day uh, are not existing anymore or that we have new professions or, or, or all, all that sort of change. Well. The thing that this is, uh, my message is that this is continuously changing. Now we have social workers uh, that are working in our healthcare centers, uh, helping out uh, to better um, deliver uh, healthcare services. For example, we may have social workers uh, outside of the surgery room uh, to see whether the patient has enough social support for him or her to be discharged uh, or for him or her to be entitled for an early discharge program, well, 
the social workers that were not before in our healthcare organizations, now they are there and now they should have access to the, to the medical records. So, well, we need to shape or we need to uh, fine tune these laws in order to accommodate all these different and new, uh, I would say, professional roles or profiles. Uh, this is again a uh, focus on the on the on the three exceptions. So uh, when it's not for clinical purposes, mainly the three exceptions are these these uh, these three ones in here. Uh, we've building or we've been using this a lot as you can can imagine uh, during the pandemic. This is something that has allowed us. Uh, in the context of the state of alarm and and, uh, and the well and all the 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 damage that has been caused uh, by the pandemic and also trying to avoid it in here we have been done we have been doing some things that we could not do before if we were not in such a in such a situation Judicial, well, you can imagine, comes uh, under, uh, under the requirement of a, of a judge. And then uh, the part uh, on research that, well, that requires, uh, depending on the situation, uh, the patient consent. And, uh, well, there are, there are other, uh, I would say, situations in which you can use the data. And that's, that's the focus of this, uh, of this last part. Uh, and I think that's interesting because this is precisely a, a, a master's on, on, on biomedical research. So when it comes to research, there are different uh, situations uh, that have uh, specific uh, regulations. So you have the one for clinical trials, <coughs> medicines and health products. You have observational studies in drugs. And then you have uh, biomedical research uh, when it's uh, samples or, or invasive. I have also provided you another complementary material uh, that uh, also saw in Catalonian that goes uh, deep into, into this part. It's uh, what we call, uh, it's, it's published by the Department of Health uh, of the Catalonian Ministry of Health. And it's the evaluation guideline for research projects in regards of uh, data protection aspects. And that's uh, also a very, a very interesting document. Here you have uh, all the different laws. Uh, I am no expert in them, but I just uh, did a collection for you of, the, of uh, all these laws. You see you have here one specific for, for biobanks. Uh, you have the ones uh, for clinical trials with medicine. So I, I try to give you an explanation here, even a short one for, for all these different uh, regulations. And uh, finally, uh, I think that this is an important one, even though, uh, well, the, the agreement uh, with the Agency for Quality Assessment in Healthcare, which is uh, this one that you have in here, AQUAS, we call it AQUAS here in Catalonia, even though the agreement uh, is uh, out to date uh, for more than one year, and well, we need to see what will happen with this, uh, I think that it's important to mention this program. So uh, this is a program that uh, has been put in place uh, by, the, by the Catalan Ministry of Health some years ago with the idea to be able to share uh, data in between all the different parties uh, of the ecosystem, specifically within the public ecosystem. So here, uh, either you are a hospital, either you are primary care, either you are uh, working in a university, if you are working in one of the research centers that are recognized, uh, if we, from the planning side, we need to access data, uh, research proposals, blah, 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 data that is or that has a view of the system level. I mean, it's population level and not it's just specific to, to, your, to your hospital or to the healthcare settings that you are working. That's the program that you need to go through. So there are a series uh, of, uh, well, here you have the email. 
uh, there's a web page which is explaining this process uh, very well. Sorry, I did not find. I, I think that this uh, leaflet or this infography is also in English somewhere, but I was not able to, to find it. But well, more or less explains the process. It's a process that uh, historically has been uh, a bit painful or slow because, uh, well, as you can imagine, uh, well, they have a lot of, uh, of demand of their services, but it's a service that works well and at least it has the uh, umbrella of, or it has a legal framework uh, around it that allows you to access this data and it works very well once you are working in the, uh, I don't know, specialized care setting and you also need uh, data from primary care setting or the intermediate care setting to uh, improve the, the, well, the results of your investigation or it's uh, an important part of your investigation and you do not have access to such information, well, Padres uh, should provide it, okay? So that's, that's a program that uh, you need to be aware of. Now, I mean, that was the, 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 the first part of my, of my talk and it was, well, focused on which is the current situation, uh, the situation that we have uh, here uh, right now in regards of, well, all these different silos of information that we have. Uh, then uh, when it comes to the regulatory frameworks for accessing the, the, the medical records and in which situations or which exceptions uh, there are, and uh, well, also uh, the regulation on, on, on research, I mean, accessing the data for research purposes that was or intended to be the last part of, of this talk. I know that in the last part I did not go in depth, but well, I tried to provide you with all these, uh, all these uh, resources that uh, I think that will support you if you are interested in this. Then the second, the second part is uh, what we are going to do here uh, for the future. So we know that, I mean, we are happy with the situation that, that, that we have in here, but we know that there's uh, a lot of room uh, for improvement. So all of this builds uh, around uh, a group of uh, chief information officers that uh, back in year 2015, starting a, a reflection process a reflection process saying okay listen i mean we've done all these nice things but we have uh, also an ecosystem of information systems uh, and specifically when it comes to the management of data that uh, has a series of limitations let's uh, start this strategic reflection process and let's try to build uh, something better for the future because, uh, well, the citizens of Catalonia uh, deserve this. So all this last part uh, is devoted uh, into, I would say, the outcomes of this reflection process. Uh, the, and links a lot with, with uh, well, the adoption of digital technologies uh, within the healthcare sector. So if we try to account uh, where does uh, the healthcare sector stand uh, in terms of the transforma digital transformation, uh, we rank always in all the studies that you will find uh, among the last uh, third uh, group of industries in digital maturity. And uh, we were asking ourselves, so this, this reflection process started, I mean, why is that? So which is, which is uh, the, the situation that makes us, uh, well, be in such a position? And it's not here, I mean, it's worldwide uh, that this is happening. Well, uh, our research uh, showed us that there's uh, two different types of industries. On the one hand, we have what we call these first waivers uh, in the digital transformation. And in here, we are talking about all these uh, industrial sectors that were able to perform very fast 
uh, this change towards the digital world by taking advantage mainly of the big uh, change that the internet uh, meant uh, for all of us. Uh, here we are talking about industrial sectors that could very easily transform their products and services into the digital world. Here we are talking about sectors such as uh, media, uh, software development, uh, music, uh, all these sectors were able to, I don't know, change blockbusters by uh, Netflix. Uh, I know this is something new, but uh, I don't know, media, uh, the newspapers, uh, the advertising uh, environment. I mean, all of those have mostly disappeared and they make, well, they make huge amount of money within the, within the internet. Well, all these sectors are the ones that we call the first waivers. The second waivers are those ones that obviously could not perform uh, this digital transformation so easy because their products and services were not so easy uh, being transformed um, into the digital world. And the reason for this, I mean, there are many reasons for this and for the healthcare sector, we will go uh, a little bit in depth into that. But I think that there is one that it that it's quite significant and it's that these industrial sectors share the main characteristic that the physical dimension will always be important here we are talking about healthcare where we cannot replace the healthcare professional so easy here we are talking about transportation we cannot replace the ships the the trains all the means of transportation so easy the agriculture sector we cannot change uh the 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 means of uh of farming so easily. I mean, it's happening, but it's happening at a slower pace. And that's the case also uh, for healthcare. Uh, and uh, we were thinking, I mean, this is also part of, of the research process that we conducted. And we were asking to ourselves, uh, I mean, what, what do uh, physicians, uh, in this case, think about all these technologies of the digital transformation. And we were looking in the literature, but we found this survey. It's a survey that was conducted in year 2016 for the first time, and then it was refreshed in year 2019 by the American Medical Association to all their membership. And the questions or the main questions that uh, the physicians in the US uh, we're asking themselves, and that's the four outcomes from two year, uh, year 2016, are, I think they are quite significant because they are really uh, questioning, uh, I would say, uh, the fundamentals of uh, these digital technologies. And this includes also EMRs. I mean, and they, they were saying, I mean, does this really work? Or uh, once I implement this, uh, I mean, is there a business model for this? Are these solutions cost effective? And then, of course, well, uh, a question on, on the liability. Uh, I mean, uh, if I am performing a remote consultation and I am not able to identify a certain pathology, I mean, they will be able to sue me. Uh, that's, that's another question that came to them. And then whether, well, this would work in their practice or not. So in general, in year 2016, very fundamental questions, really uh, questioning, uh, well, everything in regards of the implementation of, uh, I would say, health information technologies. Uh, in 2019, they refreshed the, the survey uh, only three years after. And, uh, well, the, the, the landscape had changed. Uh, Physicians started to be more aware of all these buzzwords that we use in the digital health world. Uh, there was some significant adoption of digital health technologies, specifically when it comes to, to, to remote consultations. Uh, but in general, well, more awareness, so uh, a, positive, uh, a positive messaging here. We would like to see uh, what happens when they refresh this survey uh, after the pandemic, after the COVID pandemic, I think that this will be interesting. But well, I think that this gives you an idea of, of uh, a bit of the flavor of, of this. And this truly links, this truly links 
to the way that we have implemented these technologies. I mean, uh, as I was mentioning you uh, in the first part of the presentation, um, the medical records, the ones that we have now, that do not take advantage or that are starting now, but in general, they are, do not take advantage of all the capabilities that technologies nowadays provide. And that's logical because once we implemented them, uh, well, this was not possible. I mean, massive uh, profiling of patients thanks to the uh, AI or, I don't know, big data technologies. All that sort of thing was not available then. So physicians really saw uh, all of these technologies uh, as a great barrier for, this, for their work. And also, uh, even as a way to, uh, they even call it the, the humanization uh, of, of health due to the usage of, of health technologies. Uh, there are also these interesting uh, findings uh, of, another, uh, of another study that tell us that the factors that hinder the digital transformation, most of them, are non-technological and relate to the uh, would be organizational possibly uh, and cultural from healthcare professionals. And that's the, here you have that the top ranked uh, factor against the digital transformation is the lack of skills uh, of these healthcare professionals that they have not been trained for this. So it's logical that they don't know how to embrace these technologies of the, of the digital disruption. But if you see here, one of the other factors, and it comes in the fourth number, is the legacy systems. And the legacy systems is everything that I've been explaining you in the first part of my presentation. I mean, legacy systems is old fashioned systems with very complex integration, that they do not speak a, a common language, that are mm, very deep, uh, I would say, into the bone of the healthcare organizations, and that, uh, well, uh, are a big mess, and, and we should do something to, to change it. So legacy systems, uh, which is or means the current deployment of health information technologies that we have, does not serve the purpose of, uh, of the adoption of digital health technologies. Uh, there are many articles where uh, you can find information about uh, healthcare professionals being affected, uh, even personally, I mean, uh, healthcare technologies causing them uh, stress due to, uh, well, massive amounts of data that they need to collect and in general having the feeling that they have to be hidden behind the screen and also patients telling uh, well I left the, the the physician consultation and he has not even touched me I mean the, the, he was hidden behind the screen just uh, coding things I mean we should ask ourselves whether that's the the the, the technologies that we want to deploy uh, at, the, at the physicians or at the healthcare professional consultation. This is another, uh, this is another one, that, that one is a, a very nice one, on, uh, well, completely against uh, the deployment of electronic health records. Uh, it's something that if you want to read, you can, you can access it. And, uh, well, there's a, or there was at that time and still is a big, uh, I would say, claim uh, from physicians and nurses and healthcare professionals in general uh, for, well, rethink uh, these medical records and do something in order to improve integration. This is a, a study that was conducted by, by Stanford, and this is another study, I mean, this is smaller. And this, is, this was conducted by us uh, once we were preparing uh, our digital health strategy. This is one of the outcomes which, well, uh, this is the level of satisfaction uh, of uh, healthcare professionals with their information systems. Here, uh, the, the top uh, mark was a six. 
So while well, you see that we barely pass in these two categories and here we, we completely fail. Uh, and that's the situation. I mean, uh, this tweet is uh, from two days ago. Uh, this is from the from the 5th of October 2021. And Aaron, uh, he's a very important CIO uh, in the US. And that's truly, I mean, what we have in the current information systems. I mean, we have a big mess of different integrations, different standards, different systems that interact with each other. And that most of the times you don't know why this is still working because, well, as you can see here, it's uh, it can be by a matter of a chance that, uh, that, that this infrastructure is still uh, being able to hold the base uh, providing healthcare services uh, 36, well, 365 days per 24 hours. Because underneath what we have right now is this. And the project that we should do is try to simplify this. I mean, just cut all of this, which is not easy because uh, we are in current operation, uh, well, we are in daily operation and we cannot stop the factory. So we need to be smart enough to find a way to simplify a lot all of this and try to go uh, well while not affecting uh, daily operation. Uh, so this is the this is the conclusions that we came uh, when analyzing our 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 information systems, and we said okay well we have a broad ecosystems of applications. All of them have the business logic and data models buried in there. That's what I was been talking at the very beginning of the presentation. The solutions are old fashioned. And uh, there is this concept of the technical debt, which means that every development or everything that we do to maintain these solutions uh, goes to technical debt. This means that we are investing a lot of money into solutions that are not for the future, that are obsolete. And that's what we know uh, in, in information systems as technical debt. Uh, we are communicating in between these different uh, healthcare organizations through interoperability solutions that uh, do not, uh, well, we have the problem of what we call the semantic incoherence. So, we have had to find an agreement in between the different parties to check which is the minimal basic data set that we can share uh, in order to try to benchmark a certain uh, healthcare process. And this is, uh, well, not the best because this does not allow us to take systemic advantage of all the information that we hold in the healthcare system. This is, as you can imagine, costing us a lot of money uh, to maintain because everything is paid centrally from the NHS and we have to maintain a lot of different information systems. Uh, innovations do not scale because one innovation that is done in Valdebron, if you try to go and plug it in another hospital which is not using the same system, you will need different integrations, you will need uh, a lot of different things. So we are very slow scaling up innovation and therefore uh, it's a system that is rigid and uh, cannot change uh, or it's not resilient uh, uh, enough uh, to well to change fast uh, and that's uh, the conclusions that we came with our answer for this uh, was a, this uh, digital health strategy for catalonia this is a document it's a thick document that uh, i have also shared with you and you will find in your moodle uh, and here is where uh, we try to uh, define uh, a roadmap that will try to solve all these uh, limitations that I was mentioning before. If we have to, I mean, this plan was done under the umbrella of the health strategy of the, of the Ministry of Health, which is El Pla de Salud specifically in the one for 2016-2020. Under the line, I mean, we, there was a strategic line called uh, digital health. And here we developed our vertical or our, our vertical strategy in terms of uh, information systems. This was participated by more than 300 professionals uh, all across the Catalonian healthcare ecosystem. 
and no consultancy was involved involved so it was really uh, a systemic uh, exercise of uh, catalonian healthcare professionals within the public sector uh, the main characteristics of this plan uh, i mean if i had to define i mean the main characteristic uh, of this uh, of this plan i would say that it's uh, patient related information centric or something like this i mean uh, the main objective of the plan is to solve uh, all these different silos of information that we have and mm, establish a new information system model that allow us to advance faster than uh, than in the past and this may mean do some uh, steps behind i mean we know that this won't be easy uh, and also as i was mentioning a few slides ago uh, it won't be easy while we need to maintain operations and the system needs to advance so once you try to stop and rethink and rebuild the basement or the basis uh, or the fundamentals of the system uh, it's a tricky thing but that's our project well uh, the plan of course as every other uh, strategic plan wanted to establish a financing uh, framework for this to be sustainable a governance model of information systems that's very important because before the day every other healthcare provider could do whatever they wanted to with their information systems now we are trying to do some centralization and put some rules for everyone to converge into the new model uh, and of course as every other uh, strategic plan we wanted to define a, a roadmap for this to be to be executed and take everyone into account so we want that we don't want to stop innovation totally the opposite we want innovation uh, for it to happen uh, spontaneously or whatever way it happens but we want to take advantage of innovation that right now it's difficult i mean innovation still happens but it does not scale, uh, it doesn't scale up because of this siloed uh, uh, approach that we have now uh, the strategy has uh, 15 strategic lines that are grouped within these vectors uh, being the building of the new electronic health record the most important one so really this is what is uh, building the foundations of the new uh, of the new strategy back in the day we depicted this into different well into seven different uh seven different strategies but the truth is this that if we would be writing this now for us all this piece so vector one and vector two for us would be the same thing but at that moment uh politically uh we could not reach consensus with all the different healthcare providers because that was really going uh, deep into the into their organizations right now i think that uh after some years have gone by i think that right now it would be no problem if we would write uh this as the new electronic health record including the primary care information system and also the hospital information systems uh, so we are thinking now about building a new ehr a new electronic health record uh that will have this longitudinal view of the patient uh since before they are born until they die and maybe afterwards because uh, you know that there are diseases that you can uh well of uh of genetic nature that you can send uh to your well to your uh, sons and, uh, and daughters so the idea is having a longitudinal view right now what we have is the vertical view of the healthcare levels and then we have tried to put a layer trying to uh, homogenize this through the shared electronic health record of Catalonia. Now we want to escape from that and just have a system that has this longitudinal view. And you will see how uh, we are trying to do this because it's not, uh, it's not an easy thing. 
Uh, well, this is the, the, the sentence that I was mentioning before from Rachel Danscombe. She's the CEO of the uh, NHS Digital Academy in, in the UK. And uh, Rachel, uh, Rachel is talking uh, about that data is for life, not just for one system. We need to data to follow the patients. Uh, we will do this following what we call the open platform paradigm. Uh, it's a paradigm uh, that was uh, this symposium that uh, was organized by EY was was an important one because plenty of very nice messages uh, emerged from there. And we are talking about building a clinical, a unique clinical data repository or a federation of clinical data repositories following the same standards and with the view of providing services. Uh, and this is following the open platform paradigm we call for everyone to be able to develop uh, technology around that. But what we are doing or what we want to do is socialize uh, the clinical data models and depict them from the classical development of software applications. And these data models be available for all the ecosystem uh, to know uh, what to consume. So basically, we are moving from different systems that have their own data layer, their own application and their own business logic integrated in one system and then we have thousands of different systems what we want to do is no just put the data layer in here just build services around it and everyone connect into this unique data layer and that's the idea so moving from this uh into this i know that for the ones that uh, you are not software developers that's well a bit maybe difficult to understand but that's what we want to do uh, this is more examples of uh, how, uh, I mean, this links to the first part. So this is somehow refreshing the, the first part uh, in a nicer way. So uh, each application is holding or hosting or storing the information uh, in a different way. And this may be the same information. This is a, the example of uh, a medication and uh, an app versus the EMR versus a, a, an app for the GP, a patient app. Well, all of them will store this differently. Uh, and that poses a problem that uh, once these systems get obsolete, you need to migrate the data from one system to the other. The new system doesn't have the same data formats. There's data lost within the process and uh, well, all in all, it's a, it's a waste of, uh, of resources. What we want to do is move towards uh, this paradigm, which is called uh, a knowledge-driven platform. And it's a paradigm that the proposal is, let's uh, depict the semantic definitions from this application. So let's move this and create a new layer of the semantic definitions and the semantic definitions of the clinical models let's socialize them for everyone to be aware which are these different uh, data models and be able to use them in uh, the development of their applications uh, for this purpose we have selected a, a model which is a open source that is called uh, Open EHR, Open Air, Open Electronic Health Record. The Open EHR is a set of standards that help us define uh, define this uh, semantic definition of clinical models. So this is not a piece of software. This is not defining interoperability. Nothing like this. And you will see it here better. Open air, and I like a lot the example of, of, the, of the Lego pieces. So open air has a, a reference model, which is that what you can imagine, uh, the small Lego pieces, that you can link this small, and those are clinical concepts, blood pressure, uh, heart rate uh, frequency, blah 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 all these clinical uh, or all these data models are these small uh, lego pieces you can merge them into something called archetypes that merge uh, different uh, small pieces to build more complex clinical uh, concepts 
And that all in all can be built into what we call templates to just define even uh, healthcare processes. I know it can be a bit abstract, but well, that's that's more or less the, the, the simplistic way of, of, of explaining this. Uh, open air works or helps you model all these, these uh, clinical models using a standardized language. It's what we call, or it's called uh, archetype definition language. Uh, and there are tools that very easily allow, yeah, uh, allow you to, uh, to model this data. And this is the, what we call the, the clinical knowledge manager. Uh, so archetype definition language, that's the language to standardize the clinical models into the digital world. And the clinical knowledge manager, this is a tool called CKM that will allow you to do this in a, in a, in a, very, visual, in a very visual way. Uh, Open Air also allows you uh, to define uh, care processes. And this is the, the, the example of an uh, outpatient uh, encounter with an ophthalmologist. So, you are able to define uh, all the different steps uh, in the care process in a structured way. Right now, every different system within the Catalonian healthcare ecosystem uh, does this in its own way. Okay, this is just an example. I don't want to go into that. So, what we are now doing is moving from this view where we just had applications building into their own uh data models just moving towards a unique data model which will be based uh on open air and we will have this federation of different uh clinical data repositories uh building on the top of uh, of open air and everyone will be using this and also following at the same time the the open platform paradigm uh, if you want to know more about the open platform paradigm, that's also another of the documents that I have uh, that I have shared with you. This is another visualization uh, just to show you that uh, what we are doing in here is creating a new layer in our uh, software uh, infrastructure, in our applications infrastructure that will hold this information. And it will safeguard these clinical models, even though the software changes, the standard changes everything, because uh, this clinical data repository will be for lifetime and not uh, will have, I would say, it won't be out to date. Of course, we will be able to update it. And for um, the archetypes and ontologies, we will be able to, to, to have different versions of them, because of course, healthcare knowledge advances. But the idea is that we will safeguard the healthcare knowledge from the development of applications and uh, in a way that we think that it will improve uh, uh, innovation, integration, care coordination, scalability, and all these limitations that I was mentioning before. I wanted to mention, uh, I, I, will, I think I will finish here because I have some other slides that you can look through it, through them, sorry, because, uh, well, these slides are the current, uh, well, where the, is the project standing right now and which are the advancements? Uh, and you can go through them and you can always reach me uh, through email in regards of that. Uh, this approach that we are following uh, and trying to break all these silos, it's something that it's not only us, the ones that are doing this. So uh, I will put you a couple of examples. Uh, the city of Moscow is currently, well, is currently since year 2009, are fully working in, in, in open air. Uh, that's uh, 12 million citizens, primary care, specialized care, uh, intermediate care. Uh, all the city of Moscow is following the, the, the open air approach. Uh, the Nordic countries, uh, in there you have five vendors of electronic medical records. Four of them implement uh, open air. We have uh, Germany that is now funding a very big project 
uh, all the COVID project uh, to track uh, infected people, vaccinations, blah, 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 is done uh, through open air. And they have a very strong strategy behind uh, open air. Uh, well, because they also see the future in there. There's uh, the high med project uh, where you have hospitals such as Charité, uh, Hanover, Hanover Medical Center and, and other hospitals, very big hospitals, very well known, that are investing a lot of money into this and also the regional federal government in, the, in, in, the, in Germany are investing money into this. We have in the NHS, the, the, the region of Scotland and also Wales that are going uh, into open air to build their shared electronic health record for, for the regions. Uh, different trusts in, in UK, uh, North Cumbria, uh, no, South Cumbria, uh, Christie's, which is the most well-known uh, trust for cancer uh, treatment in, in, the, in the UK. Uh, the Swedes, we have Karolinska uh, that are starting with this, or Norway, that 75% uh, of the country works uh, because they use a vendor solution that works on open air and they have a very strong strategy at a national level to define these archetypes and ontologies uh, in open air. What I want to say with this and for you, I mean, there's, uh, I think, or I got from Giuseppe that some of you are students that are starting to forge uh, your, your professional uh, career. Uh, I would, I mean, and well, according to your profiles, I think that that's something that, uh, I mean, if you are interested into data management, into standards, into, well, how to deliver uh, a better healthcare, of course, uh, and, and, and all that sort of thing, that's, uh, I would say, something to look into at uh, because, uh, well, it's exploding right now. And I think that we, I mean, open air is a standard that has been running for the past 20 years. Uh, but uh, when it comes to implementation, it's maybe the last uh, eight, nine, ten years. And I think that us, I mean, Catalonia, that has uh, a very strong positioning in, in Europe when it comes to digital health adoption, uh, well, has been a, a great pa uh, push for the standard and, and everyone is looking uh, at us to, to what we are doing. And there's a lack of professionals uh, that have the, the knowledge uh, around this. So I see uh, career and, and work opportunities and we are looking for profiles uh, that are interested into this and that are willing to work with this also here centrally at the NHS. So, I mean, if you are interested into this, uh, just uh, I will share my, I will go to the last slide just, well, for you to have, well, you will have the presentation. Uh, for you to have my email and, and, and contact me in case, uh, well, uh, you, you feel that you, can bring uh, or well that you want to learn more about this and that you're willing to be part of this journey that we have uh, that we have uh, started. And now uh, I will stop sharing my screen uh, and maybe yeah leave uh, leave okay. some time for the for the questions if any. Uh, yeah. Let me see how no this is not okay. Okay. So, uh, I didn't want to be so long, Josep. Uh, I, no. I hope it's okay and that we have not killed uh, or lost too many people along the, the way. No, no. Thank you very much, Jordi, uh, for opening our, our minds uh, uh, on the complexity of managing this health uh, data and the huge challenge that you have to integrate all this information for, for the future in, in precision medicine. Uh, we have... Uh, Three questions. Uh, let's start with Esther Arevalo from, from BIR. Uh, is there any global initiative to enable, facilitate the reuse of uh, EMR data for clinical research initiatives around data interoperability, data quality, improvement, etc.? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, going, going, the, that's, that's a very good question. I mean, we know, and with all the new uh, professionals' profiles that now are emerging, uh, we know that uh, in order to be able to 
give them the appropriate training, uh, it's very important to be able to access uh, to access such data sets also for clinical research purposes. We are working right now into, uh, I would say, centrally at the NHS, we are working into two different, uh, two different strategies. On the one hand, uh, for, for, for the purpose of clinical research, uh, we are standardizing all of our data models, the current ones that we have, not the open air, but this is something that we are building. We are working uh, to map all the, the data models that we have to OMOP. OMOP is another standard that I did not mention before. Uh, it's a standard that has been pushed a lot by the pharma industry uh, for observational studies, basically because pharma has been is uh, they are tired of for every other single multicentric study having to pay all the data cleaning all the data collection all, all blah 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 i mean for them it's very costly plus the quality of the data is not so good because physicians would be collecting the data in access in in excel well whatever way so there's this standardization uh, of the data models in omop that's one thing that we are working on and of course you cannot access these data models unless you go through the padres uh, or unless you have informed consent form throughout the hospital and then for this specific patient the, the hospital will provide you or the hospital or the primary care center or whatever will provide you with the data and then there is something that we believe that will help improve this situation which is the the creation of what we call synthetic data Synthetic data is uh, data, I mean, it's artificial data, it's not real data, but it's data that has been produced uh, throughout, uh, well, different algorithms and techniques from uh, original real data. Here we have centrally here at the Catalan NHS, two PhD students that are employed by us uh, that are working into the generation of synthetic data emerging from uh from well from real data and the idea that we want to do with this is to i mean op uh, this will be open data i mean we want to publish this data for everyone to be able to use it for for training purposes for clinical research for for whatever other thing that you want uh, the second question by esther is also m connecta will cover covers also well-being mm -hmm. mm -hmm. physical activities yes mentality. yes yes that's the idea m connecta uh, is precisely uh, the tool to integrate all the all these wearables that we are carrying all day long uh, sleep trackers uh, blood pressure meters all these different things we are working for example with the integration with the garmin api and with all the other apis when under permission of the of the citizen this data can be downloaded in there and then therefore interpreted by the physician or maybe the tendencies just uh flying uh to the to the shared electronic health record of catalonia okay we have a question by elena ballarin from the institut català de farmacologia mm -hmm. related to padres is there a mapping of all information tables variables that it is possible to use or a place to find it? Uh, that's, that's also a good one. No, the, ans the answer is no. Uh, uh, to the Padres people, you can approach them and you will ask for the type of information that you uh, are willing to access. Uh, this information that, uh, I mean, it, it needs to come, you need to go in there with the approval of uh, your ethical committee for the specific study and uh, the set of information that you request uh, it's the information that uh, that they will that they will provide you i mean there's a generic description of the information that uh, padres has but uh, not uh, specifically the, the the different fields in the different tables and all that sort of thing uh, it's not available to everyone. Okay. Next question comes from Giorgio Colangelo. Uh, data are and will be exploit, exploited by artificial intelligence. What is the strategy to easy uh, the process of testing and develop uh, e algorithm in a legal and pre privacy preventing environment? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, it, I, I, yeah. I, I know what I know what he's talking about. Yes. I mean, that's also that's also a very good question. I mean, here here there are uh, here there are different uh, different strategies. One I already mentioned it, which is the production uh, and the sharing. I mean, we will be sharing huge, enormous data sets of synthetic data, and we will put them open access. And that's one way that you will be able to use uh, this, this, uh, these data sets to train your algorithms. And following this principle, I mean, you will be able to, uh, well, we will be able to plug them in into our systems, the ones that we have at the NHS, because the data will be in the format that we have. We are also working into generating uh, synthetic data also from a mob, and that would be uh, more easily uh, moved into other uh, settings that they use the OMOP uh, algorithm, uh, the OMOP uh, standard. That's one thing. The second thing uh, that you are talking about, and it's a very interesting one, it's the concept of what we call the uh, federated learning environments. So the federated learning environments is precisely what you describe. Uh, describe. It's some sort of sandbox where you have uh, data partners, and these data partners put around this sandbox uh, all their data sets following a standard. In this case, most of the federated learning environments are using uh, the OMOP standard. Now we are working in a project uh, bid for the, NA, for the NIH, the National Institute of Health in the, in the US, uh, precisely on this federated learning environment. Uh, so basically, you have the data partners that the only thing that they bring into the consortia if their data sets, but the data doesn't flow uh, or doesn't fly from the origin uh, into the developers. The only thing that you do is you, you plug in your algorithm on top and you see the performance in a specific data set. And once the, uh, the performance of the algorithm has been demonstrated, well, then we may decide uh, to implement it and to start consuming it. And here it's when it comes uh, well, how do we certify these algorithms? Because now you know that there's a new regulation on on, on uh, medical device and apps that also includes uh, all these sort of algorithms. And the second thing is how do we pay for them? I mean, it's uh, well fee for service or stuff such as this. It's something that is uh, under discussion right now. <laughs> but the concept that you are talking about is this federated uh, learning environment. Uh, we have here, and that's the last part of my answer, uh, the TIC Salud and Social Foundation have started working into building uh, such a piece. And right now, I mean, they are the ones in charge of the AI strategy at the level of the government. And they are the guys that you should be approaching uh, if you want to do something on algorithms directly uh, at the system level. If not, you can also reach to me because we also have here at the Catalan Health Service uh, a research group on data science that is basically also working in this. And we could try to find uh, partnerships in, in between your research institute and, and our one and try to do things together because we are very keen on this and, and training uh, PhD students and well, working on this area. Okay. Uh, uh, Jordi, I have a question mm -hmm. uh, related to, to digital health. Mm -hmm. We have heard some some bells. I mean, uh, in different forums about uh, smart contracts for authentic authentication of information and, and, and for the consent. I mean, uh, it has to do with the confidentiality of the data. So, mm -hmm. if I correctly understood, the idea is that uh, one person has one genome and and the clinical information, and he can receive the certificate, a Q code and this uh, with a contract and and he can make permissions to do everything uh, the research and whatever so you don't need this consent that they have to sign mm. where yeah. we are <laughs> well, no, that's that's also a very good one i mean here i mean this is this is developing uh, this is developing very fast uh, this is developing uh, linked uh, to the to the advancements in the in the blockchain uh, in the blockchain world, uh, you know that the well, the uh, possibly the, the most known uh, smart contract is the one for uh, for the bitcoins. But then you have the Ethereum, and then well, different initiatives have been emerging. 
there have been uh, there has been a lot of uh, of concerns about the crazy energy consumption of this uh, of these algorithms and of these smart contracts. Uh, they are be being used for everything now. I mean, uh, basically for trading fi financial assets. But now it has changed into be able to trade even uh, well what they call non fungible uh, assets, uh, the the NFTs, which is just uh, card games and all that sort of thing in the digital world. They they have even been selling animations that are supposed to be uh, to be unique. Uh, in in Europe, uh, this links a lot uh, with another concept, which is the concept of the digital identity uh, of every citizen. This includes healthcare professionals or uh, ourselves, either with the role of a healthcare professional or with the role of, uh, as a patient. You, Europe is working a lot in this concept of the digital identity, which is uh, lately, it seems that it's lately more important than your legal identity or your national ID card. I think that the trace that you leave in the, in the network, uh, so to say, or the internet, it's even uh, strong or in the digital world, it's even stronger uh, than, the, than, than the trace that you leave in the in your national ID card. Uh, Europe is working in this and they want uh, and they have a very strong strategy linked to a, a, a project that has emerged from the private sector called uh, Gaia X and uh, we link, uh, I mean, we will have a very big European blockchain uh, identifying uh, every other citizen. Uh, member states are still in discussion about this. Locally, we have uh, the, the department or the regional ministry uh, of uh, digital policies that they are working on our own digital identity uh, and uh, in our I would say regional or national uh, blockchain uh, for smart contracts. And this is still uh, under development. There are other governments, uh, the Andorra government, the Luxembourg government, they are working also in this. But the truth is that we, as far as I know, there's still nothing uh, which is implemented in uh, other than proof of concepts, pilots whatsoever. Uh, right now, and for the specific purpose of the informed consent forms, the clinical informed consent form, we are working in a project trying to standardize the informed consent forms for all the Catalonia region, for all the network of public providers, and we are trying to work with this uh, digital identity from the, the local one. So really being able to work with these smart contracts uh, trying to have a, for the clinic, so it would be our proof of concept. So trying to, this uh, smart contract to be signed by the clinical, uh, by the digit, sorry, by the digital identity of the healthcare professional and the digital identity uh, of the citizen. Uh, when it comes to all the other clinical data, well, that's, I'm not so sure about this, specifically when it comes to the performance of these uh, algorithms and the huge uh, electricity or power consumption. Uh, in order to be able to hold all your, inform all your uh, health related information in such uh, uh, blocks in the chain, uh, I don't see it happening yet until, I mean, there's a lot of expectation now uh, about the new network of blockchains that will emerge possibly lately this year. It's a network called uh, Polkadot. Polkadot will replace, uh, I mean, it wants really to decentralize the internet and the way things work in the digital world. They've been able to start running what they call the parachains uh, of a canary network that is the one uh, that uh, started this process, but that is called Kusama. Kusama started to launch parachains and late in the year will be Polkadot. Kusama is like the test environment and Polkadot will be the production one. And this is uh, under some umbrella, which is called what we call the Web 3.0. That is the new web that comes completely, uh, well, follows a different paradigm than uh, Web 2.0, where big corporations hold 
the control of the network. So this is the last intent of uh, we citizens to escape for, from the control of big corps. And this has a lot of link with the smart contracts that you were mentioning. We are trying to work in this. We believe that this can be something. Uh, but right now, I would say we have this proof of concept uh, in the inform clinical informed consent forms linking with the local uh, blockchain uh, that is being promoted by the Department of or the Ministry of uh, Digital uh, Policies. Okay, thank you very much. Esther, I think the last question is, uh, is, is saying some hospitals are working on EU projects with some components, Workstream, aiming to improve data access, reuse. It was, it's an observatory point in EU, for EU. <laughs> Is there any way to link these hospital level projects to the strategic master plans? Uh -huh. Well, that's also that's also a very good question. I think the Health Outcomes Observatory, I think it was an IMI project. I think that Vallebron, Vallebron I think it's doing one of these projects. Uh, I th well, I think there was only one project that won uh, and uh, it was a call from the IMI, uh, Innovative Medicines Initiative. For this specific one, I think this is truly being able to connect, uh, well, to collect uh, prompts uh, out of a specific treatments. And yes, uh, I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, we need to work, let, let me say in such a way, I mean, we do not want and we cannot, uh, and we do not want uh, to put any barriers for innovation to happen. Uh, completely the other way around. I mean, we want innovation. We want to foster innovation. What we are trying to do here is just try to put some rules or some uh, guidelines. Let me say in such a way uh, for this ecosystem not to be more complex than, than it is. So right now, what we ask all these uh, healthcare organizations that are working in such projects, also including European projects, is to approach us and see how we can make converge the our strategy with the, the different goals of of the project and 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 try to make the best usage of these uh, public funds because uh, well at the end european projects it's also a uh, public investment public money and we should give this money the best usage not just for the benefit of the specific hospital that is doing the innovation or participating in this project, but to the overall, I mean, the idea in here is to achieve uh, scalability of these projects. So the, the, the idea is you approach us, uh, we are accessible in this sense, and we try to, to well, to, to give you some advice on how to uh, position your project for it to be useful for everyone. Okay, so Esther says thank you. We also, so uh, let me finish uh, here with, uh, with uh, this seminar, uh, congratulating uh, Jordi for his uh, nice and outstanding talk. Thank you very much. I think it has been also a rich discussion and I hope to have you next year in our master again. So thank you very much. And Thank you, you, Josep, for giving me the opportunity. I hope it was not, uh, yeah, well, I try to maintain the, yeah, the, not go into too technical, but well, if someone needs uh, more information in regards of our project or on how to engage with us, I'm uh, more than open to it. And yeah, very happy to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.